just do that. I think it's the easiest thing. So hopefully you can now see the whole screen. So welcome today's web to to today's webinar. Uh, we're going to really be talking about modern GIS advantages for teaching. So this one's definitely focused on on what you do in the university or the institution that you work at and how you engage with students that are learning uh, GIS or looking for those skills in GIS. So before we start, there's a little bit of housekeeping and also probably a little window into this strange way that my brain works. All of the mics should be on mute. We're using GoToWebinar again. Now, Jenny and I have had a little back channel chat just before we started. This is the first time we've used GoToWebinar for a while. So bear with us. We're sort of getting used to a different system and it all looks slightly uh, unusual. You can't unmute yourself and we can't unmute you either, unfortunately. So you can't say anything like we used to do in Teams if you wanted to come in and ask. So you're going to have to ask your questions. Uh, so where I've put raise hands and we can unmute you, that's clearly wrong. Um, but what you can do is scan the QR code and I'll maybe try and get you the link to the Slido from Jenny um, <clears throat> if we can get it then we will and we'll put that into the chat window oh, I've got it here uh, so if you go to slido.com <clears throat> actually Jenny can you put it into the chat window because that's going to be easier than me cuddling around realize that I should have actually I'll just Going to edit my story in real time. I'm going to see how easy it is to use a story map. Come in here. There's the code. I'm just going to publish this. Once it's published, <clears throat> we'll be back in and you'll have uh, the code to type into slido.com to get into the question session. Uh, so let's come back in. There we go. So the code is hashtag feb. 2724 where you can scan the code the QR code next to next to Freddie. So that's the way that we're going to be doing questions and answers. You can uh, once you're in Slido, if you see a question that you like and you really want answered, please upvote it because we're going to go through those questions in order of how many upvotes they've got just to give us some ranking. That's the way that they're going to appear for us in the back end. So if you like a question, upvote it. Also just have a little read of the questions that are already there. Somebody might have already asked your question um, if not stick it in. I'm working at home I'm not expecting any children to come in today but um, you never know what can happen when you're working from home. So I thought I'd really start with just a reminder of what modern GIS is or what our definition of modern GIS is and it's not really anything fancy it's just GIS that recognizes the existence of the internet really. <clears throat> it's It's a separation from from the GIS that we used to do, uh, the GIS that I certainly started with, which was GIS. I was connected, my computer was connected to the internet, but the GIS itself didn't really leverage that data connection. It sat as a, as a sort of ring-fenced application accessing data on the computer's hard drive, or if you were really lucky, lucky network drives within, um, within the building. Or the university and the output was probably going to be a picture or a paper map that I sent to a printer and that was GIS that's what we did we had usually quite powerful machines and pretty nice monitors and you just beavered away and that was it and that's not really what we do these days we now work within a rich ecosystem of applications which allow us to do a lot more in a lot more different environments. So the ArcGIS system is a whole lot of apps and those apps allow you to work seamlessly in the field, in the office, or engage with communities. So if you think about it, we're collecting data uh, on mobile devices, we're collecting, those mobile devices might be consumer grade mobile devices like iPhones and Android phones that we have in our pockets. They might be high-end devices, uh, they might be Trimble's, Topcom, uh, Topcons or, or Leica devices which have an operating system and an app on them. And that data can flow into the office where we do some analysis and we can also pull in data from the four corners of the internet into our desktop environment uh, and then we can 
push that out to our audience, not through or limited to paper maps, although you can still do that, but through interactive web mapping applications, dashboards, um, experience builders, etc., or story maps like I'm using for presentation. Now, I quite like this, this slide because it kind of gives us that separation and it talks about other things uh, where my cursor is, there's there's things like Microsoft PowerPoint, there's integration tools which go into different software vendors applications. So Microsoft Bridges, Power BI, et cetera. And it is a big, big thing. So this is what we would consider um, modern GIS to be. But why really is modern GIS important? Well, it's a good question. I did ponder this when I was putting the presentation together. What the hell am I going to actually be presenting on? Because most people will be using web applications. So I peeled back and had some insightful advice from somebody a lot younger than me that's just gone through this process, Benny, my colleague, who uh, I was going to say, unfortunately, he's skiing this week, uh, which is really lucky for him. Uh, so I'm doing the webinar rather than, than Benny. But he was like, well, you know, you go to university to get a job. And I was like, yeah, 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 but what about the research? And he's like, well, research is still a job. And I was like, okay. So then we, I looked at the numbers and, you know, if that's the purpose of a university. Then, you know, it's split between furthering scientific knowledge and developing skills in, uh, in students. And we've got 2.8 million students in the UK, apparently, according to the government in 2021-22, which is insane. <clears throat> and 500,000 of those are starting postgraduate courses. So that 500,000 figure is, is the number of um, new enrolls into postgraduate courses. So that's going to be MSCs, MAs, and PhDs. And of the, the 500,000, 100,000 are on PhD programs. So that, that could be a first, second, or a third year, or if you're as slow as I was, fourth year. Um, <clears throat> but what we have there is a tapering pyramid. And if you think about tenure track academics, then oh, how many of my PhD cohort are now still in academia, either working as researchers or 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 uh, lecturing staff? It's probably out of ten of us, maybe two. I think two are still doing it. One's doing very well. He's a professor at Birmingham. I still don't understand what his research is. He spent most of his time in a Wendy house, uh, interviewing kids about place and space. Um, but it's a small percentage that go on to, to that, that tenure track within academia and the rest of us go off. And I suppose we have to make sure that, that the academic sector is developing lots of things in students, developing their minds and their horizons, providing inspiration and skills, but that they should translate themselves to prepare the student for the next stage of their journey. And it's often to enter the workplace. And I did put an asterisk in here because I still think that holds true if you are going to be an academic. You know, when people go in the real world, well, universities are the real world. They're struggling um, with budgets and overheads. They're large organizations. They've got bureaucracy at the highest level. They've got unrest. You know, Aberdeen, Aberdeen University is going on strike next month. Um, they're not dissimilar to, to normal places of work in that respect. Uh, so I consider university to be a workplace as well. But if we think that our job within the academic sector, or sorry, your job is to just prepare students for, for work, then you know what skills are we talking about? And there's a fantastic uh, survey that was put out by the AGI. And if you haven't seen it, you will get the link to these, um, this story map, and the link is here. Uh, the skills survey, 2023 where they sent questionnaires out to the geospatial sector and they asked what they were looking for in their next um, recruitment and this is the list and you can see that data analysis was highest on the list the data processing just behind and there's a decreasing percentage down to i think the blurb at the top suggests that the softer skills people management etc are down here but soft skills the generic soft skills is sitting in at one, two, three, four, fifth in the list. So there's four 
hard skills. Now, if, if I had my webcam on, you'd see me doing rabbit ear, um, inverted commas. I hate the term hard and soft, although I do have that later in the presentation. I'll, I'll go into it more there. But this soft skills coming in at number five. So we've got some hard skills and some soft skills. But I think this list is really, really interesting, especially when you then think about how you teach or what you could teach with. Data analysis, data processing, data visualization, advanced data manipulation. They're very broad, and you're probably all doing a fantastic job of levering your teaching to support students to have those skills. Oh, apparently my webcam is showing, and you can still see me doing rabbit ears. Good work, Jenny. I will not pick my nose thinking that my webcam is off. But this is really uh, an interesting uh, window into the recruitment across the geospatial sector. And I would encourage you when you get these uh, the slide deck to click on the link and give it a good read. It's been written by pretty good people. Um, one is actually my former boss at Adina, uh, Anne Robertson, so a shout out to her. And they followed it up with um, a breakfast meeting that our head of recruitment went to. And I've got some, some insight into that about where they want to go, but I'll not share it on this call because I don't know if it's for public dissemination yet, and I think they're writing up a report on that. But I would have a read of this. Okay, bingo time. I've got some numbers on the screen, and before I get into the meat of the presentation, I thought I would just go through them. So we've got 556, 180, 185, 37, 24, 7, and 5. Well, these numbers are applications uh, that were listed, are currently listed in job vacancies on the Indeed website. So scraped out with their little API. And if we want to know what they are, they are that there are 556 vacancies which list GIS as a requirement and 180 listing ArcGIS and 100 listing QGIS. And then remote sensing is at 85, and you can read the rest yourself. But I think it's quite an interesting snapshot. The one that I'm most pleased about is there are only five jobs listing ArcMap. Oh, I've been going on about the death of ArcMap for so long. It's nice to see it below Carto, right down the bottom of the list. I should have asked Benny to look at ArcView or ArcInfo to see if we got any at all with those things. But this is really interesting, and I think it's a, a nice way to look at it. Um, so you can inflate that ArcGIS number by an extra 60, perhaps, because these ones were separated out and didn't mention ArcGIS, but what we're mentioning ArcGIS online as a string rather than, than that. But uh, it's a really interesting snapshot. And I, I'm, I'm still pleased that QGIS is there. And I think it is a very relevant piece of software within both education and within the commercial space, because not everybody will have the means to get our software, and it means that organizations can continue to lever good GIS uh, to solve their problems. This is being recorded, and I don't mind saying that, obviously, but most of you know me fairly well. All right, keep going down. So why are you here, and why am I talking? Well, I thought I would provide some examples <clears throat> to show you perhaps how you can tweak what you currently do to ensure that even more useful skills get embedded into your students. And these examples, um, they're either developed in collaboration with some universities or stolen from information that I have gathered from universities. And I've not put the logos of the universities up. I don't think they'll be too annoyed. I'm not giving away the crown jewels. They're pretty simple things. They also, critically, don't require you to do a course rewrite. And I'm pretty sure that you can lift elements of what you're about to see and just drop them into your existing modules. Or you'll realize that you're already doing it and you probably just need to amplify what you're doing to signpost the skills. But we're going to come to that in a second. So let's go through some of the examples. I'm just going to probably cough as well. So I'm going to mute myself. Oh, the kids have been back at school after half term for approximately six and a half days. I'm already sounding like I've been smoking for 40 years. I blame them for all of my ill health at the moment. 
Okay, so the first one that I'd like to talk about is really developing field work skills. Now, I've spoken at quite a lot of um, good little events. Uh, Derek Franz from Chester and uh, Alice from University of Reading run Enhancing Fieldwork Learning, which is a great little conference series. And we've, we've long talked about the importance of field skills and what you need to do to embed them. And here is a really simple sort of pre-field work exercise uh, which you can give to students and it has a lot of benefits. Uh, one, it can simply familiarize the students with the field area so they get a sense of the lay of the land before getting on a bus and driving there, uh, usually a little bit hungover. Um, that might actually sort of alleviate some of the anxiety of, of, of going into the field, that they're not going to be, you know, 10 miles away from where the minibus parks on a windswept moor, it's actually just off, you know, the A9, turn left, turn left, and then you're there. You'll be back in Abbeymore in no time, if you know where my example is, which is near the Cairn Corms. So relieving or alleviating anxiety is, is something that you should be acutely aware of um, in, in your students, especially in first year. They might not have been in the field. They might be from an urban environment and you're taking them into a uh, rural environment. Or as one of my friends in first year, uh, in my undergrad days, he was from uh, Shetland uh, and he'd never seen an escalator and things. So the urban environment scared him witless uh, until he went on lifts and escalators. But anxiety is a real thing. and This might be a good way to do it. But actually, what I think this is really good for is making sure that the precious time that you've invested in getting students into the field is well used. So what you've got in the video is a little swipe map. And the task that you set your students is to start describing the field before they get there, looking for features and describing them. They can use a measure tool if you embed it into uh, the little app that you build so they could see how long this feature is that's just in the middle of the screen. How wide is it? How high is it? They just have to count the contours. Not difficult. And once they've then marked up their map with the evidence that they've gleaned, and in this case, the evidence is an ordnance survey map, uh, which I've embedded into my application, which you are allowed to do. You download the data from Adina, from um, <clears throat> the Digimap service, which is amazing. And then you can load it into an application and share it to your organization. And then on the right-hand side, you've got the high-res imagery that you get in ArcGIS Online. So you're getting two different data sources. So they identify the sites that they want to go to in the field to gather more evidence to improve their descriptions. Critically, we're not naming features at this point, we're just describing them. You then travel to the field and they visit their target sites in an efficient, coordinated fashion, uh, and they gather the evidence. So in this case, you know, there's a little stream running down the back of this feature. Maybe it's going to have eroded that feature. I might be able to get a look at the internal fabric of that landform and see if the stones are angular or sub-rounded. Is there any uh, structure to it that I could then add to my description? But you're targeting the student's uh, field type so as it's maximized. And then they have to write up the evidence that they, oh, well, I'm not even reading point number six. When they're in the field, you might want them to get uh, to gather that evidence in survey one, two, three. And then it's digitally enabled and it's instantly available within ArcGIS Online. And when they come back, combine their desk study with their field study to have a really good, robust description of the feature and then name it. Name it at the end. <clears throat> so I think that feature is probably a lake deposit as well. Um, and that's what he might be getting to. So when we break this down, so here's my marked up um, data set from the field. And I've got these two deposits and then something blue with some lines. What did we do? Well, they understand what a desk, desk exercise is. They'll understand why that's valuable and efficient. They'll be working with primary and secondary data, so they're collecting their own data and they're using other sources. They're working with both raster and vector data. They're going to be collecting um, vector data in the field and they've got a satellite image and some maps, so they're working with the raster data. Working with the West maps, what's the advantage of that over a satellite image? Discuss. 
what can you glean from one that you can't get from another? How can you use them in combination to get a better picture? So they're extracting different descriptions from different data types. They've also learned how to navigate little ArcGIS apps. You could show them how you put it together as well, or give them the blueprint of how you put it together so they could try it themselves. They've also planned their time efficiently for the field. They've used Survey123 to capture their field data. Maybe you've shared the form with them. Uh, they've combined observations from multiple sources, desk and field, I might have already said that. They've reported their findings, possibly using a story map. So when you break down that little exercise, there's a whole host of things that they've actually learned. The next one is, is, is sort of taking this uh, one level further and it's collaborative field work. So we know that we can share things with groups in ArcGIS Online and that's really what we're leveraging in this example. So we're going into the field and we're going to be collecting data in either Survey123 or uh, field maps. And that is going to promote things like data collection consistency. It's hopefully going to remove, reduce blunders. We're not going to have photographs which are misattributed to different points or lost. Uh, nobody took a picture because you can't complete the form until you've taken the picture. And in a featureless environment, such as these sand dunes in the photo, your accuracy is probably going to be better with your GPS than just trying to guesstimate off the map because it's quite difficult to do that in a, in a, in a small, tight uh, sand dune environment where if you're at the bottom of a dune, you can't see any other features, you're definitely guessing. So the idea here is to create groups in ArcGIS Online. So as you can split your students into smaller groups of maybe uh, three or four and set them off to collect data as a group. So in this photo, you can the two photos, you can see that one person is using a digital device with field maps to record information. And the other people are dropping um, sticks on the ground to make a quadrat, a meter by meter quadrat. And somebody else has got species identification charts. This is probably a sort of an ecology biology example, but it could work for anything else. But you're getting them to work in combination. One person doing this, and it would be all over the place. You know, you'd get your sticks out and then your folder would blow open and everything else would disappear out of it and then you would have put the device down and it would have switched off or something. But getting them to work as a team to collect information and use different things is quite important. So you get every group to do that across um, a feature and <clears throat> they collect their own data and then they come back with their measurements uh, of whatever they're doing. So that's part one in the field, but it's got teamwork and group work, and it's got, again, these, these multiple devices. You've got a revoke recording device, and you've got some cards, and then you've got some other uh, measurement devices. This has got a part two to it, that if you do have individual groups working across a landscape, then you know it might be very different on transect one than it is on transect six. So group one are going to have a completely different experience than group six. You're going to find different things because something's happened. You could imagine this on a mountainside looking at vegetation. The people at the top are going to see very different things from the people at the bottom. You don't have enough time to go to all of the sites. But with the group working and with group sharing, we can solve that in ArcGIS Online. When you come back from the field, you get time or the students get time to work on their individual recordings to get a better picture of their, what they did for maybe one practical. And after that, the second practical, you as the admin have collated all of the data together into one master data set and shared it with, the, with, the, with all of the groups. So now they get to see the big picture. And again, working in their small groups, they write up their report with their detailed analysis of what they did and what they found on their section, and then the big picture right up where they're combining everybody else's information. And if you've got your forms right, the data should be roughly consistent. You know that the problem that you've got with groups is that some groups are going to be better than others. And then when you ask people to use other groups' data, 
some people feel let down because they know that they've put everything into their uh, data collection and they're going to get some crappy data from somebody else. Hopefully, the, 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 the forms that you build in, in field maps reduce that risk. There's base data and your assessment can be structured around that sort of minimum viable data set that, that they, they have to record in the digital device. But again, what have they learned through this exercise? Quite a lot. Bundles of teamwork, loads of communication, because from those two photos that I showed, you know, you've got somebody standing on the quadrat, somebody with the species identification, and somebody then recording it. You've got to get the information relayed succinctly from one person to another uh, to keep it all going, especially if you're in a sand dune, it's windy and there's sand going everywhere effective communication, digital field skills, you're still getting your analog field skills in there. So it's, we're not saying replace everything with digital. Nope, we're saying use digital where it makes sense to record the analog stuff. And then you've got two things that you can put down. Keeping notes in multiple places, what does that mean? Well, field maps is great. Survey one, two, three is great. I'm not sure I would do a field sketch in either of those two things. I would take a photo and annotate my photo. But if you were asking me to do a sketch, no. If I had to write more than three sentences on a digital device, I'd probably get a notepad out. Um, it's not the place to do everything. You can have a field notebook and maybe you um, ask them to write robust notes in their field notebook, but at each site, you take a picture in survey one, two, three, and you put the um, field location into a field in survey one, two, three, and into the notebook. So as you've now got an analog and a digital with a consistent tag, and you can then join them if they type up their notes into Excel, and then you can have a bigger data set. Record stuff in the most sensible way. Also, that works quite well if you've got a waterproof notebook, a chart well. <clears throat> I don't have any on my shelf at the moment, um, but you know, a waterproof notebook is far easier to use when it is absolutely hammering with rain but you can still get your digital device out. And that photograph, I think, showed a digital device in a really nice otter case. <clears throat> so this is gonna be pretty good to use in wet weather. The, the device itself isn't gonna get damaged. But honestly, it, if that beveled screen is a small swimming pool, the screen just is not quite responding in the way that you want, and you have to keep drying it to get best performance, and it becomes tiresome. But you can push through if you're only collecting metadata on it, and then the other notes are in your waterproof note. So the hybrid model still works. I do understand what happens in the field, by and large, <clears throat> and digital is great up to the point that it isn't. They're merging data. They're looking at micro and macro scale features. They're looking at transitions along a long thing, getting that big picture, and they've learned some other Esri tools. But they're going to have to present their findings. So there's some presentation skills coming in. So there's definitely a mix of hard and soft. Looking at the time, I'm going to whiz through a little bit. Building on previous years. Well, this is this is such a simple one. Uh, in the last two examples, there's been a little bit of presentation uh, through things like story maps. Why not retain some of the previous year's good work? or maybe some other not so good work, the average work, the, the scrape to pass got a distinction, two examples, and show that to the next years that are coming through. Now, there's a few advantages to doing this. It, it, it clearly demonstrates what the ask is of your exercise. It maybe gets a bit of insight into the marking criteria, so the students know what you're expecting. And the really interesting thing here is the gamification of it, because they'll want to beat what the previous year did. They want to do a better uh, job. Yeah, and to do this, once the, the, how would you actually enable this is that you would um, you would get your groups to report things in story map, and then as those students migrate into the next year, you want to take ownership of those story maps. Uh, 
and take them into your own account. So as if you delete those students, if they graduate, you still retain the examples that you want to show to the next year. It's really simple, documented here, and I can support you if you think that's a model that you want to follow. Where I've seen this happen, it's been fantastic. Um, because <clears throat> we know that students are competitive. Uh, and we ended up, I think I ran something with, a, with the university. And in first, the first year we ran it, it was great. The second year, the lecturers showed the, the second year what the first lot had done. And in that second year, both the lecturer and myself were asking the students how they had actually done what they had done in their visualizations because I didn't know. I didn't have enough time to keep up with the, the, the ArcGIS system. So it's almost like the student becomes the teacher because they have explored the platform or the system to get functionality uh, to beat that previous year. They've expanded their knowledge uh, massively beyond what uh, the lecturing staff were expecting. And it is really great to have them explain what they've done to you because you learn something. But you then use that in the next example and wait for the students to surpass that. So I think this is the final example that I'll show in this section. But it's starting with the end in mind. And what do I mean by that? Well, how do you get students to engage in the first few weeks of their course? Is there anything that we can do with ArcGIS to promote that? Well. We want students to mix. We, we, we want them to be a cohesive group because you're going to be separating them up into, into smaller groups throughout their, their, their activities. And we know already that fieldwork is a great way to do that. Uh, but could you conceivably run a bit of fieldwork with first year students within their first th two or three weeks at university? Probably. I mean, most of them are going to have a mobile phone in their pocket. Um, and you could set an exercise where you get them to go into the local environment around the university, uh, just outside your campus, to collect some information on things that they can see. So if you're in an urban setting, it might be access to green space. It could be looking at the high street for breakdown of the shops, or maybe it's you know uh, free cash points versus paid cash points that they need to go and investigate. Is it access to fruit and vegetables versus fast food, all of these little things. And you design a little survey, one, two, three, and you share it to the entire year. And then one Thursday, they come in and you send them all out at the same time to work in groups of three or four, and they have to go out and investigate it. Unbeknown to them, the data is flowing back into a dashboard and they come back in, they sit down for part two, uh, and all of their data is instantly available with the pictures on the screen. And you go, right, what's going on? And this uh, little image here that I've thrown together, um, which is completely synthetic data, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, it's got points which have been collected. And then in the back, I've just got index of multiple deprivation census data. And you can clearly see in Sheffield, there is a bit of a divide from the east side to the west side. And I think this side uh, is generally uh, more deprived than this side, which is less deprived. Uh, and then these dots might relate to that. So it's quite easy for them to then look at the data that's been collected by, you know, 100 people, you would get lots and lots of dots. You would have an interesting data set. And the dashboard is the tool that they then use to investigate what does this mean? What is the social fabric? What is the green space? What is the utility of the area around our campus? And they have to write that up in a little story map. And this exercise, super simple as it is, helps them think about answering questions with data, fundamental to the GIS journey. It gives them basic GIS knowledge. Hopefully, that dovetails in with what they did at schools. It may not. It may be they're still their first exposure to GIS. And they've collected some data in Survey123 and realized it, it it wasn't hard, it was quite easy, but if everybody does it, the power of the group is, is substantial. And they've experienced an ArcGIS dashboard to start to investigate questions. I've missed off story maps from that list, but clearly if you get them to report it in a story map, then they would, they would interact with that. 
But wider than that, I think the real benefits of these lower ones in this example, familiarizing students with the local area and its problems. You don't want the university to seem completely separate from the environment in which it sits. You want the students to interact with that environment and understand it. Who lives locally? How do, how do the, what is the human physical uh, geography relationships in the local area? And they're interwoven. Now, I'm unashamedly a, a physical geographer. I hated human geography. Now I'm much, I have a much better understanding and appreciation of human geography, probably through GIS. Um, but this never happened when I was at university. We just took options and we were separated out. They might meet new friends. They might have nobody that they know when they start this exercise and it forms those links um, in that, that year group very, very early on. But really importantly, I think it also, it makes them understand that the field is not somewhere scary, remote, hostile. It can actually be anywhere. It could be just outside. Also, it's a really good example uh, of where you can get them a little bit wet, not very far away from home. And that is a really good reminder for them when they are going slightly further away to be slightly better prepared than they were last time. If you're going to fail, fail local rather than when you're in the Lake District going, oh yeah, maybe I should have brought a jacket. True story, I had to almost escort somebody off a glacier because they had forgotten their jacket. Now I had two in my bag and tried to give them one of them and they refused and they then put a bin bag over their head with a hole and pinned their arms inside and thought this was acceptable whilst walking on quite a steep icy slope. And I could just imagine them scuttling off the end of the glacier at 40 miles an hour into the moraines. So, you know, I had to tell them to grow up and just take my jacket and put it on because I didn't really want to be responsible for that. But fail local is, is quite a good message to think about. And if you are running field work in first year, you can do it very locally. Uh, but I also think this big data set could be really interesting. If you ran this for a couple of years, you could look at temporal change uh, with a big data set and you would have hundreds of people collecting points. If they all collected 10 points each, that's a lot of points. Can't even do the maths. Right. I'm going to pivot slightly here into, into a, a distinct sort of discipline or aspect of GIS for a second. And it's really around imagery and remote sensing. And that's really because I think what we're doing in that space is interesting. Apologies whilst I. And ArcGIS is now, in my opinion, and others too, an end-to-end -end remote sensing application as well as a GIS application. And GIS and remote sensing have traditionally been thought of quite separately. And I suppose in most universities that I come across, there's often a remote sensing module, which is optional. There'll be a foundation GIS, but then remote sensing, you'll have advanced GIS or spatial analytics. And then you'll have a, another fork off into, um, into remote sensing. But GIS is actually relying a lot on, on raster imagery. Um, and I think a lot of that is to do with, one, we've got freer access to satellites and satellite data from, from Landsat and from ESA. But also, we've got drones. You know, we've got a plethora of, of low-cost sensors, lower resolution, but they're flying a lot closer to the thing that they're trying to sense. So we actually get some pretty good imagery out of them. Um, so yes, I think that they should be more integrated. And the advantages of having your introduction to remote sensing within ArcGIS is that you keep students within a familiar application. So they don't get confused. The, the interface doesn't overwhelm them again. It's something that they've already been experimenting with. They know the process of opening it up and saving it, etc. And there's this little article here that I've got a link to later on, but I can actually add the link in here which kind of explains quite a lot of this and, and the different applications that you can use. But perhaps starting simple is the key. And this, is, this, this is quite hot off the press. This sort of came out about a week ago, um, two weeks ago. So this is the new rebirthed um, Landsat Explorer. And I kind of promised myself that I would do a live demo of it. 
and I have just used it yesterday. So on the left hand side, I'm going to go for 2017. Let's go for somewhere in July because it'll be a bit greener. And then on the right, let's go for <clears throat> Ooh, well, let's come into roughly where I am. And you can see different, you, you know, you've got a, a swipe now put in. You can also do a bit of analysis, but I really haven't explored this. But you can also then start to look into the different bands and uh, various different um, different remote sensing-y type things. So you've got NDVI to look at vegetation, et cetera. Uh, but there's lots in here. The, the dev team in the States have really put a lot of effort into into the new Landsat Explorer. So the question is, you know, what could you use that Landsat Explorer to teach about much lower down in your GIS program? Temporal data? Yep. Resolution? Because, you know, I zoomed in too far and it was a bit crappy. Bands? What even is a band? Macrogeomorphology? Definitely. Uh, environmental change? Definitely, because we've got that temporal aspect. It's not just for the physical geographers urban change as well, um, especially because we've got, got quite coarse resolution when you're looking at areas which are seeing a, a population boom. We could definitely chart some of that through, through the Landsat Explorer without getting too deep and having to download images and think about bands, just a pre-configured tool that you get them to go off with a set ask. You're going to go over to a city like New Delhi and you're going to then find an image from 2012 and from 2022 and you're going to explain the development trends. Various bits and bobs. Really, really neat and a good evolution of a tool that was already pretty good. But if you haven't noticed, ArcGIS image for ArcGIS Online is included in the chess license you should find it in your ArcGIS online account if you don't just email me and they'll it'll have been dropped off a list of being added in i just need to request that it gets added to your site but what is it what is it and what does it do well it's it's taken a lot of the raster functionality from ArcGIS pro and dumped it into ArcGIS online i think this is hugely significant because if you are going to teach basic remote sensing within ArcGIS, it actually kicks the moment that you need our desktop software much further down the road and keeps you in that lightweight online tool for longer and that is good for the students because it's easier and they're less likely to get disenfranchised by overly complicated interfaces more likely to be successful with answering the questions that you've set them and feeling empowered that they've actually succeeded which then enthuses them to take the next step. You can find out what's new in it, this, this great blog from Jeff. Um, the highlight message though is there's now, I, I tried to find what I would consider to be the best functions that you could do. And I went through the what's new and there was about 30 something updates. And then I found that there were 172 raster functions available in ArcGIS Online. I thought, right, I don't have time for that, but you might. You'll probably be surprised by what's in there. You go, really, is that in there? Oh, maybe I could use that. There's also some amazing blogs. I'm continually astounded by the quality of the blogs at the moment. Oh, this is good. I mean, how to make a historical animation with Landsat. John Nelson, I've got a definite man crush on his cartography this style but he makes amazing little um how to's and in this one he's just taking 30 years of landsat data and making a really nice little animation showing deforestation so that little caterpillar munching track of the roads coming in and then forking out and taking all of the trees and then it's palm oil in no time at all but he'll show you how to make that powerful animation what else could you do with that what other um things could you apply that to? Well, that's for you to think about. And it's a three minute video. Absolutely incredible what you can do. And we also have drones. So we've got this, this drone capability and you'll find that you've got ArcGIS, you've got drone to map standard in your accounts, drone to map advanced 
in my view, does the interesting thing. I am fighting your corner to try and get it added in at no cost, but at the moment I haven't managed to be successful, so it is a small extra charge. Um, so I think it's about one and a half grand for 50 users, which might be enough to teach, and it's pretty good. Um, it also allows you to collect super high res imagery of a field site. So that resolution question, what can we see, what can we look at? You could collect your own temporal data to show temporal change, looking at maybe you know, high energy stream environments, which are definitely gonna change through a flood event. What could you do? Also, there's a good uh, employment angle for, for students that see drones. They're quite tech techy. You might see them as a bit of a toy, a bit of a pest, but they definitely have utility within our space that they might not have looked at. There's a reminder to the very good Story map uh, careers guide from um, from Ben from Heliguy demonstrates that uh, quite eloquently. And moving out of my comfort zone, maybe even more out of my comfort zone, uh, stretch activities into coding. I don't think ArcGIS notebooks is being used massively widely across. Uh, the higher education sector in the UK and teaching. I know some universities that are using it. So if you're on the call going, no way, Addy, we've been using it for ages. I'm maybe not talking about you, um, but it's definitely a good stretch activity. It's there in ArcGIS Online. And it's there for you to use. But why would you want to use it? Well, we come back to that thing about a familiar environment. Actually, it's more critical than that. If you're gonna be doing coding in Python, and I've done some on my laptop, I am not the world's best coder by, by any means, but you know, setting up my environment. I got my environment working on my personal laptop, I got it working on my work laptop, and then it broke because there was an incompatibility and I haven't managed to get it fixed. I was like, ah, screw this, I don't have time. Time is quite precious. If you are faffing trying to get your students' coding environment set up, you are not gonna be a happy person. So why not use ArcGIS Notebooks, which is pre-configured. You can just launch a new notebook, start coding, compile, run, done, image. Instant, it just works. And I think that is, you know, we talk about frictionless approaches. You want the root of least friction if you're gonna do Python. I thought I would also just include here for people that are going, oh, that is interesting, but you know, where would I get the students started? There's quite a lot of really good information. So this image on the right-hand side is what we've got in the lecture with um, portal under the data science tab. And it just takes some of the Esri Inc learning, which is structured uh, and, and surfaces it to you. If you go into the Esri Academy, then you'll find even more. If I click this button, it's not gonna work because I'm not logged in with the right credentials out of the swap browser. So I'm not going to do that. The Esri Academy will require you to log in. Uh, but that's usually with your ArcGIS online credentials and you should have access. Okay, the last thing I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna have to speed up, is local test beds. Now, 10 points to anybody that can tell me which university this is from. Uh, somebody on the call will know. But local test beds, you wanna do more with your students, you wanna get outside, you wanna collect some data. I'm gonna cough again. Apologies. Or you want to have some interesting little problems to solve using GIS that are local to you. Well, your university is the place to do it. And the estates team probably have a bundle of problems and not enough resources to solve them or not enough knowledge and skills to solve them. So could they be the hidden gem on your estate? So how might it work? Well, usually by just reaching out to them and going, hey, can I have a chat? Can I buy a coffee and just talk? I've got these students, some of them want to do projects. Coughing again. Oh dear. Um, there we go, right. And it starts really understanding their pressures. And if they say, we need to do more with less, we need to do some mapping, we'd like to understand what's going on in our state a little bit better blah, blah, blah. A lot of the problems that they describe, you'll already as a solutions architect in GIS have worked out in your head, and then you'll be working out whether or not you could apply that into a first year, second year, or third year um, course, or whether it would sit as a separate dissertation. But I think they're worth engaging with. And some examples recently, I spoke to one university 
uh, the estates team. They said that they one of the things that was on their um, their checklist was that they they wanted to do some uh, uh, ground surveys to find some buried assets without digging up the ground. And I remembered that one of my former PhD colleagues was um, was a senior lecturer in geophysics, and his specialty is uh, ground penetrating radar. And they're at the same university. So I sent an email and introduced them. And what he was struggling with was getting health and safety sign off from the estates team to do GPR across a piece of grass on the university. And it was a lovely little moment where they were both struggling and then together they're now doing it. So lecturer is not going to do what they were going to do. They're going to do it in a slightly different place to find some buried assets. University is going to be stoked because they don't have to pay to get that. So everybody's happy. All they need to do is close a little internal road on the campus to do it, which the estates team helps facilitate. So it's lovely when these things happen, but they only happen if you reach out and make the connections. And in that case, it was just me speaking to two people or speaking to one person or remembering another. There's no reason why you can't do it. And the example on the screen from Edinburgh University where they, they wanted to collect biodiversity information on their campus. Now this project was run by the amazing people at Adina, Guy McGarver in particular, um, but they actually employed students to collect the data. It's very different to that teaching thing, but there's no reason why this project couldn't be replicated as a student project run by a department with the data feeding into the estate team as the stakeholder. Understanding a customer stakeholder um, relationship um, data requirements, etc., timelines. It, 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 it's a great example to, to give your students if they are going to go off and become professional GISers. So, one ask for you is if you think that last estates thing is interesting, I'm running an estates webinar next month um, and they can sign up through this link. So, again, you'll be getting this, um, this story map. You can just fish that link out and send it over to your friend in estates. So, when you reach out, this might be the thing that you pique their interest with and say, if you don't really understand what I've been talking about, come to the webinar. It's an hour at lunch and you'll see lots of examples. So, circling back to the start about the skills, and I've got this hard, soft thing again. And you know, are the hard skills really GIS, remote sensing, coding, statistics, and maths? They're kind of like, is it the, the, the professional skills as opposed to interpersonal skills, I think is the other way to look at these rather than hard and soft. But I think the examples that I've shown, and they're very superficial. You would do a much better job of working them into actual teaching because you are actual teachers. I think they cover off both hard, soft, or professional and interpersonal quite well. And those things, if we think back to the AGI report, would give the students a massive advantage when entering the workplace. But I suspect a lot of you are already doing this. The question is are you adequately signposting? those hard and soft skills that they are gaining in the exercises? Probably, but I think when I went through what have we learned, you know, I, I was like, oh, we've learned quite a lot. And I was putting them down and, and almost asking myself to stop putting more on. Because the students need to be able to get those skills that they've learned and drop them straight into their CV with confidence. And then when asked to give a demonstrable example of that in an interview, relate it back to the exercise where it makes sense and talk with confidence, because that will get them their job. And really, that means making it real and not abstract. Real, not abstract, and then he has a completely synthetic image. But this is a real use case. This is a flood model with 3D buildings, and there's a color, which may mean critical or non-critical infrastructure, and looking at resilience to, you know, um, a natural event. If you want more examples of what real, real, uh, real careers look like, then I'll remind you that the Careers With um, website is there for you. There's also some really good videos, and I'm going to add to this list. Um, there's some customer success videos from Esri UK. The Esri Ireland portal has some amazing videos from Dublin Airport and Dublin Port, and there's also a water company in Ireland where there's a really good video. 
these are real people working in real jobs using GIS to solve real problems. And what you're doing is scaffolding those skills into lots and lots of students, just making sure that they understand this exercise gives me ABC. That means that I can apply for these jobs. It, it is really critical. And some students just don't quite see it. So we have to make it more obvious for them. And I'll leave you with the extra resources here that you can click on um, and the blog we've already been into. But this is the unfiltered blog. The last one was filtered on remote sensing. This one is now unfiltered. There's just a phenomenal amount of resources in this blog. I keep forgetting about it. And when I do a webinar, I'm like, oh, I wonder what's on the Esri blog. And then I realize, you know, there's another one from John about making another amazing map. There's some stuff about Stuttgart 3D, the stuff they've been doing in, um, in Stuttgart. Stuttgart's the dev center for some of our 3D stuff. So if you get bored of Stuttgart, it's because that's where all of the 3D whiz kids are uh, in Esri. But uh, what they're doing with Reality Studio will be really, really interesting. Have a look through this because you will find um, food for thought, some fodder that you can then turn into some, some interesting resources. The final thing he says is the Jack Dangerman Award. If you haven't seen this and you've got students that are using ArcGIS, get them to look at it. They could win a trip to San Diego to go to the user conference. All they have to do is submit a story map telling us what they're doing with ArcGIS. Make it interactive, make it fun, make it pretty, make it informative, and they'll stand a good chance of winning. The closing date for that is the 31st of March. So not a lot of time, but I'm sure you can get some of your students to enter. Anyway, right, I'll go and have a look at the questions. That's all of the content I've got. So let's move the questions over. Questions. Where do I find the questions? Jenny might have to come in and help me. QA. Is Survey123 still relevant or has Field Maps become the go-to app? What is the difference between the two? Well, it's a good question. Uh, the difference is Survey123 is a question, a form-centric app, and Field Maps is map-centric. So you get this little, um, you know, you start Survey123 with a whole lot of questions, and then geography, i.e. where is this happening, will be one of them, whereupon Field Maps it's it's about a map where you then want to record something at a point. Um, so I'd think about what you're trying to record. The other way to look at it is with field maps, you can actually customize the map that you take into the field. So if you were going to go and sample it set places in a featureless landscape, then I would prep that data and have the coordinates of the sample points all mapped out, loaded into my field map, and then I would navigate to those points in the app itself because you can have all of this data on top or if you were looking at um paleo river channels and you wanted to go out and dig a pit if you can map those paleo channels from satellite imagery and you can load those onto your base map in field maps field maps becomes the thing uh, i can probably surface some resources which explain more of the differences um, and then circulate them around with a follow-up email. Hopefully that answers that question. And I don't think we've got any other questions. Edinburgh, question mark. No, if that was for the Estates and Facilities Office, that is an incorrect answer. I'm not gonna say who it is, you have to guess. But um, if nobody's got any other questions, then I, I can uh, just go off and cough myself into oblivion in a corner. But um, you obviously can't shout out because we, we're not allowed, we can't unmute. But um, hopefully you find something interesting in that. If, if there are some things that you think I haven't answered, or what if I wanted to do this, you know what my email address is and you'll be receiving a follow-up email just ask. Uh, we can put our thinking hats on. I have spent time with some universities looking at their courses and working out how we can make it simpler and more interactive. And sometimes it's just, um, yeah, just just ask and, and we'll, we'll try and help. Okay, well, we're two minutes over, or well, we started two minutes late. 
as normal. So I am going to let you go and finish off your lunch. Hopefully enjoy the sunshine and hopefully see some of you um, in the very near future. Thank you.